Hello friends, welcome to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. And I tell you what, I am incredibly excited to be speaking to my guest this week. Pat Candelis is the director of Catching Lightning, which is an investigative series which examines the life and career of MMA fighter Lightning Lee Murray, who was involved in one of the largest cash heists in history. It's four one hour long episodes. It's available right now to watch on all Showtime streaming platforms. Pat, welcome to the show. And before we get going here, I just want to say congratulations. I absolutely loved, I love, I love sports documentaries in general. Uh, and although this is, you know, part sports do documentary, but also uh, almost like a crime thriller in many ways, a real life cr crime th thriller. Um, I was just blown away. I found it riveting, raw, emotional. Um, I, have a, I have a mixed emotion of bags, um, you know, in the aftermath of absorbing everything. Uh, but first and foremost, just congratulations on, on putting this all together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Before we get to the documentary, you're a two-time Emmy award-winning director. Um, so can I just ask how you got into filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, and 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 kind of getting to the to the level of, of winning two Emmy Awards? Uh, luck, uh, <laughs> luck, luck, and uh, hard work. I, I went to film school uh, in college. I actually uh, I did a, a study abroad for a summer semester in England, in London, um, which was in I think like oh four, uh, and yeah, just coming out of college. I mean, it, it just kind of naturally. Did a lot of stuff in production, different things, live production, live music. Uh, and then, yeah, just kind of fell into that. Uh, those are the stories that I really was drawn to, liked telling. And for some reason, I just continually get drawn to overly convoluted, extremely complex stories. And, uh, you know, myself and my team, we get kind of obsessed with them and love spending years of our lives <laughs> working on them. And Catching Lightning was no different. How did this get presented to you? How did you, you know, come head to head with the Lee Murray story initially? Who who pitched it? Did did you find it yourself? Did someone pitch to you? How did it come together? I stumbled upon it. Yeah, nobody pitched it. I stumbled upon it. I, I can't, I was reading, I saw something online. It was something, and I read an article and I can't remember which one because then I read every article, you know, um, and it was the same, same question. Like how, how has nothing really been done on this? And, and I, I found out pretty quickly <laughs> why, uh, because, you know, Lee Murray and his family have, have not participated in, in anything. So, uh, I mean, that was in, I think 2018, something like that. And I just started digging, just doing research. Uh, uh, and yeah, I, I, <laughs> I talked with, uh, uh, the wonderful execs at Showtime, Vinny Malhotra and Steven Espinoza, and they said, let's do this. And uh, so we started, I mean, we started in, uh, I think the first interview was September of 2020. So it's been a long time to get here. In those early stages, was it difficult to to get this project greenlit? And did you have to pitch and repitch and try and get you know, stakeholders on board to, to allow you to do what you want to do with this documentary or was that quite a fairly easy process for you? No, it's, you know, again, like it's, it's Vinny and, you know, again, like it's, it's Vinny and so many different projects. Uh, I, I love, they're my, my brothers from another mother. I love those guys so much. They're wonderful execs. And I think there was just a level of trust there. Um, we were coming off of a five part doc that we did called outcry. And I've done, I think three now with Steven and four with Vinny. So we have quite, quite a good uh, shorthand and you know i think trust each other so no it was actually it was actually a very quick and easy process as you start to kind of get the gears going and you know start the production on this documentary from the from the offset what were some of the biggest challenges you were facing as you kind of you know started this journey covid was a huge one i mean cuz cuz we sold it right when the shutdown happened essentially so we were all under the impression that again, like this is going to be over by summer, you know, and then we'll be able to really start shooting, which absolutely, of course, did not happen. So uh, the first, I mean, that was the biggest one, right? Was we can't even get in England, you know, 
Uh, they're, they're not accepting anybody right now. There, there was nobody flying at that time. So the first interview we actually did was Pat Melitich in Iowa. And me and the crew drove from Texas to Iowa uh, to do the interview with him. Um, and it was slow going because we just couldn't get in anywhere. But while we were waiting for the travel restrictions to, to be lifted, we were just constantly on the phone calling people. And, and we made pretty good progress pretty early, I would say, with, with people um, kind of in Lee's circle, but with the police right away, they were, they were on board in England, the Kent police. Uh, and then it was kind of a slow process. So weirdly, I think it was probably the fact that this took three years, the extra time probably helped because we weren't rushed at all. So we could, you know, take our time and then eventually find the people that we've been looking for for a long time and talk with them. And yeah, it, it worked out pretty well. When did you know you had something with this documentary? At what point did you say, oh, we've got gold here? Like as you kind of go through your production process? I mean, as everybody kept saying, yes, that's a great feeling, right? When, when my goal and my team's goal, we want to get every single person's perspective, right? From all sides. So this is such a complex story of the world's largest cash robbery in history. So to get the, the police officers that are investigating this, right? Multiple, the hostages and Securitas, right? The people that are there, the, the prosecutors, the defense barristers, um, and then the fighters that knew Lee that could really add the context and the necessary uh, information to allow the audience to really understand who Lee Murray was um, as a, as a three-dimensional human, which was another goal of this is that he's such a mythical guy, you know, it, it, he almost doesn't seem real, you know, and everywhere you go in England, everybody knows Lee Murray, everybody's best friends with Lee Murray. Everybody has a story about being with Lee Murray. Um, so, you know, that was, it, it took a while to get the family to come on board. Um, and I understand why. Uh, and, and, but I think, again, we had so many other pieces of the puzzle. And I think, you know, the fact that like, look, we want to tell the story from every single angle and include everybody's perspective here. Uh, that's what we do with all of our work. And, you know, I think it was good timing, really. About his family, how did you actually get them on board? Like, who do you talk to? Who do you liaise with? Um, how do you kind of like indirectly get Lee Murray's blessing, if that was something that you had to get, how did this all kind of shake out in terms of Lee Murray's friends and family? That was a long process. That was a long process. And it was initially talking with his attorney. And then it was going through, you know, and, and having phone conversations, then meeting people in person. Um, but they they were, it, it took a while for them to to, I think, you know, officially sign on. And then when they did, they were, everybody was all in, which was fantastic. Um, but I mean, they were, they were great. Uh, you know, I had, I had somebody ask me the other day, like, were you ever in danger? <laughs> I'm like, no, not at all. They're really nice people. They're, they're not criminals. They're normal people. So I, I think a lot of this is always when you meet people like this and they're, and they have trepidation, which I completely understand. It's like, they're testing you. Right to see if you've done your homework, you've done your due diligence. People do that all the time, and I, I tell people like, "Let me just buy you a cup of coffee. Ask me anything, you know. Like, mind me for information." And so there was a lot of that when I first met with the family. There was multiple family members there, and it was a lot of them asking me questions. And I, my impression was again, they're they're testing me. They're testing me to see if I've done my homework, done the research. I know what I'm talking about, um, and I, I I think I passed that test. Was there any pressure in your mind when you were going to meet, obviously, Lee Murray's attorney and the family? Because without them, let's be honest, it's not as strong as a piece. No, right? not a and, and if you don't get them on board, it's a, it's a bit of a, a problem and a challenge for you to figure out how best to kind of navigate the waters of putting this documentary together. So was that a bit of a pressure moment for you to make sure you can sell them on what you're trying to do with this documentary? Not so much, but no, you're absolutely right. Like it, it, I, I completely admit that it would not be nearly as good if they were not in it, of course. Um, but no, I mean, it's, I, I didn't expect them to say yes. You know, so my expectations were pretty low. Um, but no, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, I didn't feel a lot of pressure with that. It's like, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, I, I want to include you guys in this. I, I want your side of the story in here. 
Um, everybody else decide is already in here. And that's kind of been the way that this has worked out for the last 17 years. So, you know, here's a shot. If you want it, let's, let's do it. So that's basically it. It's a pretty simple pitch. Um, and no, I mean, I, again, I think, I think I just got lucky when it came to the timing. I think that was it. You know, outside of the family and the friends, I mean, the fact that you've got the biggest element of this documentary, Lee Murray's voice. Yeah. How did you do that? How did that come together? That is the most fascinating part for me as someone that understands a little bit about film production, documentary filmmaking, and just producing content. Unbelievable that you've got his voice almost narrating his perspective and his POV throughout the entire four episodes here. How did you do that? Well, that was the moment when we were going, oh my God, like, not only do we have the story, like, we can actually incorporate Lee's voice. I didn't know that those recordings existed. They didn't tell me that until well into this process. So again, I think it comes back to the whole test that they were doing. And then, I mean, they sat me down one day and said, we've had these recordings for years of that multiple recordings with multiple people, Lee's friends and family members, uh, his wife in particular, Nicola, um, that they've had. And I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And, and again, it's because they said, you know, there's been so many things that have been done that are not accurate. You know, they felt like everything, every news piece, every, every article, whatever it was, publication that talked about the story or talked about Lee Murray, they felt like was not accurate. So they started recording phone conversations with him in prison. And I was blown away, completely blown away. And then, uh, and then we started hearing them and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. You know? So it was an amazing moment of, wow, we can actually include Lee's voice. Cause I've never interviewed Lee Murray. I've right. never spoken to him. He's in a maximum security prison right now. You know, hopefully not too big of a spoiler alert, but you can Google this pretty easily and see. And so, you know, you can't, there's nobody outside of a couple of people that are on the list right for the prison for him to talk to gets to speak to him, you know? Um, so, uh, I've never spoken to him, never interviewed him at all. And the fact that essentially these people had asked him questions about what happened, what his role was, you know, what are you thinking? All of this stuff was an absolute gold mine. And, and we got very, very lucky you know, to, to be able to include that. But again, it's, it's why it's the dream to go, Hey, we can actually piece together this from his perspective as well. So we can bounce back and forth from the police saying this happened and then him saying this happened and vice versa. So you're getting it from both sides, which is everything that you want when you're making a doc about something this complex. Isn't that so bizarre? I mean, like you said, like the, the figure that this whole documentary is centered around. You have not met him. You have not interviewed no. him. And yet it's it's such a integral part of the experience watching this documentary. Unbelievable that that landed on your lap there. Well, and it's it, it, when you hear it too, you know, like you, when you hear somebody's voice, you learn so much about that person, you know? And, and like, I remember my whole team, like the first time we heard it, everybody listening to it, and you, there was other clips, you know, archival clips of him speaking, but not that many that we could even find. And we had tons of people looking for it. But when you hear him talk, I mean, that was the thing that was so surprising. You're like, okay, this is going, just his voice takes you beyond, again, like the kind of shallow, mythical, you know, uh, a reported version of who he actually is. And to hear him speak about these things, it's like, it, it just it creates a completely different picture of who Lee Murray is. And I think we get by far the closest that's, you know, any story that's ever been told about him as a three-dimensional person, not just a fighter, not just a criminal, right? You, you get, you get to hear from, from him in a way that, I mean, hell, nobody's heard his voice publicly in 17 years yeah. outside his friends and family that are on that call list. So yeah, How it's much? shocking. How much of those recordings didn't make the doc? Like as you're kind of going through the editing process or and the creative process, when you're deciding what to include, what not to include, how much did you have to play with and what actually ended up making it into the documentary? There was a lot. 
there was a lot because I mean, a lot of them were, were random conversations and things like that. So it took a lot of time to, to break them down and go through them like that. But I mean, it was, I was surprised how much stuff was covered, you know, and I think it was, you know, again, through the progression of the case evolving and the reporting on the case and, you know, he's there when the trials are happening in, in England, you know, so like you can hear conversations about what's coming out in the news at that time. And, and he's over there, not, you know, being asked about it. So it's, it's wild. It's, it's unbelievable. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I can't, it was a very nice surprise, a very, very nice surprise. You mentioned earlier on, you know, you got Pat Miletic in this, you got Chuck Liddell. Can I just share one of my favorite people that you have on, on this documentary is Dave O'Donnell, Cage Rage uh, yeah. Dave. Um, yeah. Just to kind of uh, share a bit of, uh, of my personal journey, Cage Rage and Dave O'Donnell and his team gave me my very first media credential. When I was, really? breaking, in, when I was breaking into the biz and I was, you know, based out of London, and I was trying to like figure out a way to kind of cover the the local sport. My first event, my first credential event was a, was a Cage Rage event. So when he popped up on the screen, I'm like, oh my God, that's Cage Rage Dave. And, and obviously yeah. he's such an important part of this story as well. So I, re I was really, you know, pleased to see him looking so well and still being the kind of character that I remember yeah. him uh, from, my, from earlier in my career. But what were some of your favorite interviews with the cast of characters, whether it be friends, friends or family, people from the fight community? Who were who some of the favorite interviews? Views that you conducted as a part of this documentary it's funny that you have a history with dave because he is a character he is a character really really nice guy great guy i mean he said yes right away um uh and weirdly i'll just throw this out real quick but weirdly we were shooting the recreations in england mm -hmm. and we're, we were the cast and crew was staying at one hotel and while we were outside getting set up for something i turned and looked and there's dave o'donnell after this was like a year or so after i had interviewed him and I'm like, Dave? And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just here. So we just randomly bumped into him while we were doing that. Um, but he's a great guy. I mean, all, all the fighters were amazing. They were absolutely the nicest guys. They were extremely generous with their time. And, uh, you know, it, it, if, as a fight fan, it's a dream. It's a dream to get to sit down and talk to Pat Militic and Anderson Silva and Chuck Liddell. And Tony Fricklin is just... You know, I feel like he kind of steals the show every time he shows up on camera because he's so funny. He's so animated. Um, but yeah, all of those guys, those were all, I mean, I loved every single one of those. I can't say which one would be my favorite, mm -hmm. but I had an absolute blast talking with those guys. Now, obviously there were some people that you couldn't get a hold of, that you couldn't interview for one reason or another. Yeah. Is there anyone in particular that, you were like, damn it, I, I wish yeah. we got that person. Like, can you, sh and can you share like what that experience is like to actually go through a situation where you get a no? Yeah. I mean, it happens in every project. There's always going to be somebody that's just not going to, not going to agree to sit down. Colin Dixon was the big one in this. He was the bank manager for the Securitas company um, who was kidnapped. And, and, you know, I made contact with him and was just trying to get him to even agree to meet with me. He wouldn't do it. Wouldn't get on the phone, wouldn't meet with me. So there was, there was no way around that. So that was disappointing. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a few other people. Um, uh, but I mean, I, the, Colin was by far the biggest, by far the biggest. I mean, the, the police are going through in detail, essentially what, what his perspective was and what he's testifying to. So you still get it. Obviously, I would want to hear it directly from him. So, you know, that was, I think, the biggest piece that we missed out on. Um, but I, you know, the other part was that people didn't, uh, you know, people didn't believe, you know, that, <laughs> that we were doing this. People didn't believe that, uh, that Willie's family was participating, you know, so when I would reach out to certain people and say, Hey, no, we're, we're, this is happening. We're doing this. I'd really love to get your perspective. No, no. And no, you're not talking to them. There's no way they would talk to you. So that happened a couple of times. You landed on four one hour long episodes. And I'm just curious how was that decision made? Like when you were kind of like cutting it all together, was yeah. there ever a period where it was like, oh, this could be like a, 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 a one sit, two hours, could it be longer, shorter? Like what was your process into determining where to land with this series? Well, it could have easily been longer. And I mean, we pushed it as far as uh, shows on the loudest. The fourth episode is actually an hour and 20. 
So the fourth step itself is essentially a feature film, but there's just so much to the story. And there, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that we, we had to cut. Uh, it could have easily been five, you know, it probably shouldn't have been six, but I think it's harder to keep an audience, you know, for that long. So I, I feel like the four, you know, with Showtime being generous and letting us do a little bit over was the right way to go. It just felt like the best place to land for the story. Um, so we're not constantly being, you know, redundant in what we're saying and, and trying to, I never want the audience to feel like we're stretching anything out. We never want to do that. Right. It's like, we're not trying to do it to get a sale that's for six episodes or something like that. The story always dictates that, you know, but if, if, you know, most networks, if they think that that's what you're doing, they'll cut it down. But I'm constantly like, we have this, this, and this, that's really important. But you know, that's what the editing process is always so complicated. It takes so long because things can seem great in your head and, and in theory. And then when you see it on the timeline, it just doesn't work. So it changes constantly, but I, I feel, I feel like it's a fast four and a half hours, but I'm definitely biased. I was not bored whatsoever. You can give me <laughs> 10 more hours if you want the, the director's cut, the unedited version, give it to me all. I loved it. Um, did you ever find yourself getting too attached or, emotionally attached to this project and is that a good thing a bad thing and, and is that how you tend to operate with any of your projects is it hard to not be emotionally attached to these things no i don't I, I don't think i am emotionally attached to them i think i i think it's again it's it's uh a, a drive to tell the story the best way we possibly can which for me always comes down to first person accounts that were there right i i never want the audience to feel like i'm trying to tell them anything you know, uh, we want to include all of this so that everybody makes up their own mind and makes up their own their own decision on, as to what they be, believe, they don't believe, or what they think. Right? My my goal in making something is always like if you have two people sitting on the couch watching that they're pausing it and they're arguing, right? Because one feels one way, the other. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. I think uh, I never feel like I could get too emotionally attached. It gets hard after years of working on it you get too close to it in the sense that you you don't know if it's good or not right because you've seen it so many times and the hardest part about doing this is you know separating yourself self knowing everything you know and thinking about the audience who might not know anything about the story you know so that always weirdly is is the biggest challenge is you know trying to always ask yourself like you know is a, is a regular person going to understand this they don't have that context you know uh in, in thinking about it in that term so that you don't just get so tunnel vision with it because it's not for me it's it's for the audience so in that and yeah there's times where it's like man I, i'm too close to it i need another pair of eyes to look at it right from the people and maybe this is in your circle friends colleagues that have seen the final version What's been the reception so far? Well, you know, friends and colleagues, yeah, they're always going to be really nice. So it's been positive, but I take that with a grain of salt. Um, you know, because I mean, I, I my wife will tell me if she hates it, but uh, you know, beyond that, I feel like people are always to your face. They're going to be really kind and really positive about it. So I'm always, it's you know, the a really tough part of this is when you do it for a really long time. You get finished with it and then it's months after you finished it that you're waiting. You can't even talk about it, you know, and then you're just like, I'm always anxious about it coming out and here. I want to hear what people think about it, you know, good or bad. I want to hear it. So the, the months before it airs is terrible. It's always terrible. Just waiting. <laughs> what are you what are you hoping people take away from this experience watching this documentary series? I hope they're entertained. I hope they come away with a greater understanding of one of the most dramatic, you know, you called it a thriller at the beginning. And I, I think that's exactly right. It's a thriller. Um, but one of the most spectacular robberies that has, you know, uh, meticulous planning in it. Um, uh, and just, I, I've never seen it such an ambitious crime, you know? Um, so I hope they're entertained by it. I hope they understand that better. And then I think, you know, uh, you rarely get a chance to meet somebody at the center of that and as an audience, right. And then hear from them. So I, I hope the audience comes away with a, a, a good understanding of who Lee Murray is, you know, good or bad. 
I can't get the final few minutes of episode four out of my mind because you've got on the one on the one hand you've got Anton Silver right yeah yeah in in tears he's cr- and he's crying and he's emotional because it's almost as if he feels like he almost feels guilty that he had the chance he had the opportunity for fame for fortune for legacy he's one of the greatest of all time and on the other side you have Lee Murray who for one reason or another bad decision making a lack of opportunity went in a completely different direction and it's so heartbreaking but then it, it almost kind of ends with a bit of an uplifting note where it's like, is the Lee Murray story really over? Because he just feels from, you know, his his voice, he's still so adamant to get a UFC championship, albeit not himself directly, but maybe at some point down the road in the future, becoming a coach and and, and getting another fighter to that position. Just a, just an inc- And I still can't get that those final few minutes out of my mind. It, it was incredible theatre. It really was. He's, I mean... It- Lee is the most fascinatingly unique person I've ever come across. You know, uh, he really is somebody that's almost died like he did and had all this crazy, his life is insane, completely insane. Um, and so again, I think those are the moments that you would, you, you, you don't see that side of him. That stuff has obviously never been reported. I mean, God, the police have never even talked to him. They never even had a crack at him. So that's again, the importance of having, having his voice included in this so that you get that glimpse of, of, you know, you get behind the curtain a little bit, you know, it's not just a shallow look at him and trying to put him necessarily in one box. Uh, you see the real toll that this, this crime had the ripple effect, right? When that rock hits the pond, what happens 17 years later, you know, those ripples are still happening. Um, and then the fact that this is an ongoing investigation, technically, uh, and there's people that have still never been, never been caught, never been apprehended, and you know, the issue of where's the money. Mm-hmm. It's such a unique case. It really is. Um, I, and I'll share what my kind of my biggest takeaway from yeah. the documentary was. On the one side, I almost felt sorry for Lee Murray and the kind of things that had happened in his life, and and but but also I feel conflicted because. You know, he, you know, in many ways, he's he's very much a villain and he has impacted the lives of people for the rest of their lives. Yeah. But then there's a there's a p- p- part of me where I feel like maybe there's some redemption here in terms of what he can potentially do when he gets out of prison. Um, yeah, I feel conflicted emotions. Do you think that's a, a fair way to to feel? I don't know. Yeah. It's just I'm being absolutely. honest with my feelings with you. Right. But like, absolutely. that's how I'm, I felt. I'm conflicted as well. I feel mm. very similar. Yeah. I mean, he's again, like, you know, good people are capable of doing bad things and bad people are capable of doing really good things. And uh, Lee is a perfect example of a very gray character, right? There's both there. There's good yeah. and there's to, to who Lee Murray is. And, you know, I think he, uh, I certainly don't condone what he did. It was absolutely wrong. He should have gone to prison for that. I think, you know, at a certain point, what good can come from keeping him locked up any longer? What what he's been enduring for this long is, I mean, a hundredfold more than anybody else. And, you know, he did it to himself, but he made a decision. But at the same time, you know, we we're lucky that we can get into the whole, we want to send a message thing. And what does that look like? Right. So I, I hope those questions are, are brought up as well. You know, like what, <laughs> has the message been sent? I think it has. I think it has. Um, I don't know. I don't know what keeping, and I'm, you know, again, I'm not trying to say that what he did was okay. It wasn't. But 17 years later, you know, what what good can come of this, of keeping him there in those conditions? You know, I would I would love to see if if there is a redemption story there. You know, what is the next chapter? That would be amazing to see. Well, that kind of perfectly segues into my next question. If you had to look into your crystal ball, you know, what do you think Lee's Lee Murray's future looks like? It's a great question, but it's a tough one. I really don't know. I mean, unless again, not to not to give too much away to the audience at this point, but I mean, he's he's got very limited options. Very very limited options. It's basically coming down to the King of Morocco. You know, if if he decides, hey, yeah, I feel like you've you've earned the right to get a second chance at your life. That's that's it. That's really the only thing that can happen. Um, 
I would, I would guess I would put my money on if he got that chance, uh, whatever it is, it's going to be impactful in some way, shape or form, you know? Uh, so yeah, I would love to see it. I would love to see it. I would love to one day get a chance to chat with him and talk with him and meet him face to face. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's a sad, it's a sad situation where it is right now. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like Anderson has a pretty reasonable take on it. Well, I feel like this is the definitive documentary up until now in terms of where Lee Murray's life is. Thank and it you. does it does beg the question, like this has got all the makings for a motion picture, a, a movie. Um, I described it as a real life Guy Ritchie movie. And e <laughs> even the way the promotional material to uh, to announce this documentary, there's elements yeah. of, of that as well. Um, do you, would you like to see this you know, made into a movie? Yeah. Yeah. I, and uh, you know, I have, uh, I have, uh, we're, we're working on that. We're working on that. Interesting. Well, keep us posted. Scripted um, right. Scripted rights have been, uh, have been granted. Amazing. Um, well, I just, I can't get over it. I've been telling my friends to kind of go out of the way, uh, to watch it. Like I said, it is available right now on Showtime streaming platforms. Uh, and Pat, what I like to do on this show is is always try and end on, on a positive, light, and fun note. And it's always different every week with my guests. This is a, a segment I like to call the bit for social. <laughs> and seeing as though you have spent many years now um, looking at the life of Lee Murray and, and producing this documentary, I thought I'd uh, find out how well does Pat Candelis know Lee Murray? Oh, man. Okay. So so here we go. Um, pop quiz. Mm -hmm. What was Lee Murray's overall MMA record? Ooh. I want to say it was like four and two. It was eight and two with one draw and one no contest. Ouch. Okay. This Next one is... Lee Murray had one fight in the UFC. Who was his opponent? Jorge Rivera. That is correct. Great fighter in Jorge, by the way. Amazing fighter. Absolutely. Now that fight took place on which UFC numbered pay-per-view? Oh man, I know that. Uh, it's right there on the tip of my tongue and I'm, um, I can't get it out. I'll tell you. It was UFC 46. 46. Man. Man. Who was the headliner? That was a, wasn't that like Matt Hughes and Carlos Newton? Or, no, that was the, that was the one in, uh, at Royal Albert Hall was Matt Hughes and Carlos Newton. Uh, who that's, was the, that's right. Who was the headliner of the, the Jorge Rivera one? I'd have to actually Google that to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't remember I myself. To go. <laughs> um, how did Lee Murray defeat Jorge Rivera? Uh, it was a triangle choke. That's right. First round submission triangle armbar. What was the name of the London club where Lee Murray allegedly knocked out Tito Ortiz? The wonderful and notorious China White. I did frequent there a few times back in my early 20s. You, you um, know what's funny? <laughs> it's still open and we, we filmed inside. We oh, filmed really? Why? Yeah, they gave us permission. And then I came back one time after we had filmed and tried to get in and they would not let me in. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, which promotion did Lee Murray fight Anderson Silva in? Cage Rage. That's right. And by what method did Lee Murray lose to Anderson Silva? Decision. Mm -hmm. What ended up being Lee Murray's ultimate jail sentence? I mean, technically, this is a tough one, right? Because he was initially sentenced to 10, then they doubled it, or more than doubled it to 25. But that 25 didn't start until he had already been in jail for three years. So it's technically 28. Yep, that is yeah. correct. <sighs> Incredible. Uh, Pat, this was a real pleasure for me to speak to you. And like I said, I'm a big fan of the documentary series. It's incredible. I hope a lot of people watch it. And I hope that the Lee Murray story that a lot of people in the media and a lot of uh, 
old school fight fans that understood who he was and what he was. And he could have easily have been the next, you know, he could have been the first Conor McGregor. Like that's how much spunk and charisma and personality he had. And unfortunately it just didn't work out. And a lot of us in the media and a lot of old school fans have been waiting for a comprehensive, really well produced documentary series to be to be made on his on his life and the circumstances and everything that he went through and you you nailed it i think this is incredible it's it's a brilliant watch and i really hope that you get your flowers and everybody involved gets their flowers for this series thank you so much for all the kind words and for the support and talking about catching lightning i really really appreciate it and it's been a pleasure speaking with you this was fun i appreciate it too thank you pat take care and we'll speak to you soon